Good morning. My name is Mike Beam, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Secretary of the Kansas Department of Agriculture. I'd like to welcome you to the sixth annual Governor's Kansas Summit on Agricultural Growth. Uh, today's topic that we'll be focusing on here in the next 90 minutes is on the soybean and the other oilseed sectors. And this purpose will be to identify what could be done to, to grow these sectors in our great state. Our main ag growth event is back in live again, like it was in 2019 and previous years. We'll be assembling in Manhattan on August 26th. But we are having our sector breakouts done in advance and done virtually and remotely so that people like you uh, can conveniently uh, participate and give us uh, lots of comments and guidance uh, as we discuss the future for these sectors. Uh, the strength of Kansas Ag comes from folks like you. Uh, we are quite blessed in this state to have very innovative and dedicated producers and many, many uh, agribusiness services who provide uh, very needed services for the our, for our production sectors. So again, thanks for taking time to be with us. Please um, be engaged in this session and, and give us your feedback because uh, it's all very welcome and, and quite helpful. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Dana Ladner for her introduction and comments. Dana? Great. Thank you, Secretary Beam. I am Dana Ladner with the Kansas Department of Agriculture with the Division of Ag Marketing. We're glad you've chosen to spend this morning with us. As Secretary Beam stated, we are gonna spend about the next 90 minutes discussing the Kansas oilseed sector. According to estimates prepared by KDA and based on the M-Plan economic data model, the estimated direct impact of the soybeans and other oilseed sector is $1.7 billion in output and nearly 1,600 jobs, including indirect and induced effects. The total impact of the sector on the Kansas economy reaches about $3 billion in output and over 9,300 jobs. The vision of our agency is to provide an ideal environment for long-term statewide economic growth. Today's session allows us to entertain opportunities and barriers to agriculture growth for our state. A few housekeeping items before we get going. During the presentation portion of this session, all participant microphones will be muted by the meeting host. Later in the session, we've got a chance to have some breakout rooms. Everybody's encouraged to turn their video and microphones on at that time. If you have a question during the presentation, please submit your question in the chat using the button at the bottom of the screen. And the host will grant permission to unmute after we get done with the presentation. But again, at the end, we'll have an opportunity during our panel discussion. And lastly, this session is being recorded and is being and will be posted online. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jeanette Thurston, who is the Food Science Institute Director at K-State. Dr. Thurston joined the university in 2019. Prior to her arrival at K-State, she was a national program leader for food safety at the USDA's National Institute for Food and Agriculture. Her leadership and direction will keep our session headed in the correct direction. Dr. Thurston, at this time, I turn it over to you to share the agenda for the morning. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, hopefully you can see me. I, I think we can go ahead and put the slide up for the agenda. Um, so first off, you know, thanks so much for your participation this morning. It's really great to be here with you. Um, you know, and the goal of our session this morning uh, will be to confirm previous and identify new high priority outcomes and related actions that need to be taken to realize our goal uh, to grow the Kansas soybeans and other oilseed sector. Um, so many of you uh, participated in years past. It's my understanding that the Kansas uh, Ag Summit began in 2016. So for those of you who are joining us once again this year, your continued input is highly valued and appreciated. Um, while you're probably going to recognize some of the um, outcomes and actions from previous years, we also want you to be thinking about or absolutely want you to share 
any of those that we've missed or newly identified outcomes and actions during your breakout sessions this morning. And for those of you who are new to this discussion, welcome. Um, and thank you so much um, for providing your good thoughts on how we can achieve our goal to grow Kansas soybeans and the oilseed sector. Um, so, you know, I was asked to uh, kind of provide uh, the game plan for this morning. Um, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and just kind of revisit some of those high priority outcomes and action items that were identified in previous years. Um, as noted by one of my colleagues, these are pretty high level. Um, so feel free when you get into get a chance to talk with your colleagues in our break it sessions later on this morning um, to really get down into the weeds and get into the details. Um, but after we um, have an overview of last year's um, identified priority outcomes and action items. We're going to have a panel of experts uh, join us and discuss some of these high priority outcomes and then some maybe some others that they see as important to the Kansas oilseed sector. Um, from there, you'll be able to ask questions of our panel, and then we'll move into facilitated breakout sessions. Um, and during these sessions, we'll be uh, discussing specific breakout session uh, topics, and I'll get to those here in just a few minutes. But first, um, let's talk about, oh, let's go to the next slide. Sorry, I was thinking I had control, so I'm pressing my down button and it wasn't working. <laughs> so. For in the last few years, like I said, since 2016, uh, several high priority outcomes and actions have been identified um, by this group. Um, so what we did is we tried to bucket those into four different or five different um, topic areas. And these will be the specific uh, breakout sessions that we will be having this morning. So that first breakout session will be on research and development. And some of the high priority outcomes and actions that have been identified in years past include those listed on this slide. So anywhere from weed control options to biodiesel research to continued research and um, research support on, on identifying the benefits um, of, of research and development. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Another breakout area we're gonna have this morning is gonna be education and outreach. And in this uh, breakout session, you're gonna be talking about um, previously identified outcomes and actions, but of course, also new ones as well. Um, previously, um, it's been identified that we need to have more outreach on the benefits of double cropped uh, rotations. We need to have more messaging on oilseed sectors throughout the year. And we need to have effective education and outreach on genetic engineering and genetically modified organisms. Okay, next slide, please. The third breakout that we're going to have this morning uh, will be on cultivating the Kansas oilseed market. Um, quite a few different uh, outcomes and actions uh, for this particular uh, topic area um, that include anything from maintaining relationships with previous buyers and partners in the animal ag sector to promoting the benefits of oil seeds and feedstuffs, which really goes hand in hand with the previous breakout, promoting the value of Kansas produced oil seed products across the nation and the world, um, effective education and outreach on the benefits and uses of oil seeds and their products, as well as reducing trade barriers through the work with Kansas Soybean Association, the Great Plains Canola Association, local economic development officials, and state and federal government. Let's go ahead and go to the next breakout session topic. Okay, this is a really big one. We decided to combine uh, producer needs with infrastructure and funding. Um, and so there's quite a few different um, actions and outcomes that have been identified in previous years. Um, anywhere from small business incubator models, the need for those through local chambers of commerce and technical schools, to technology advancements, data connectivity, responsible stewardship when thinking about producer needs. Also the need for centrally located processing plants, uh, organizing investors around particular priorities, and identifying and supporting public-private partnerships to fund research priorities. Go to the next uh, breakout session uh, topic, please. So we also combined the federal government considerations into a breakout session this morning um, due to the number of participants that we have today. Each, each breakout session is gonna have between four and five participants, which is a really nice size group to really uh, get into the details of some of these uh, previously suggested outcomes and actions, but then also some new ones that have come to mind. Um, so for federal government consideration, things that have come up in the past is how can we increase the speed of regulatory approval process? How can we engage USDA RMA on expanding double crop insurance to additional counties? And how can we really advocate for EPA approval of new products uh, for weed resistance? 
Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so that was a really high and really quick overview of what's been identified in previous years. And hopefully all of you have taken a look at the um, sector document that was uh, included uh, in the registration. So that's the soybeans and other oil seeds documents for the 2021 uh, Kansas Oil uh, Ag Summit. Um, each breakout session you've been identified to participate in, we'll have slides to uh, remind you of some of these outcomes and actions. Um, as well as the questions that we'll be asking uh, each of you. So now let's go ahead and move on to our panel. I'm really, really excited and uh, honored to be able to uh, introduce you our expert panel. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, so our panelists uh, this morning, um, so Dr. Marty Draper uh, from K-State will be uh, leading the research and development discussion as well as the breakout group. For our education and outreach session, uh, Dr. Jason Ellis, also at K-State, will be leading that breakout group. Um, discussing cultivating markets, we have Dr. Carl Carlos Campenbadal uh, from the Integration uh, International Grains Program. Uh, discussing infrastructure and federal considerations, uh, we have Caleb Little, Little is going to be giving us some uh, talking points from the CEO, who is the CEO, excuse me, of Kansas Soybean. And we have Nicole Rizek Harrison, um, who is a producer and will be talking about from the perspective of pursuit, what are the needs in this particular area. Um, and finally, we have Dr. Alan Featherstone, who will be providing us an economic outlook, but toward the end of our session today. So let's go ahead and open it up to the panelists. So uh, I think Dr. Draper, um, we'll, we'll start with you and your comments this morning about research and development needs. Thank you very much for the introduction, uh, uh, Jeanette, and thank you to the Department of Ag for the opportunity to be able to uh, share with you uh, my perspectives on the research and development uh, priority outcomes from the previous, uh, previous ag summits. Um, you know, I think when we look at the list of the six items that, uh, that come up on that high priority outcomes list, um, I think there's a tremendous amount of relevance that, uh, that remains from each of those. Um, certainly, anytime we're involved in research, we want to make sure that uh, we are continuing the ongoing uh, process of determining where the needs are and identifying uh, new outcomes uh, that will benefit the producers across the state. Uh, agriculture is the economic engine for Kansas, and so making sure that we have uh, the best practices, uh, the best management practice, the best production practices uh, uh, is certainly an important part of our research enterprise across the state, and, and K-State's a big part of that. Um, so when we've looked at, at hemp in particular in the last few years of the hemp research program, I think one of the biggest challenges has been the learning curve. Uh, we've been very challenged by the restrictions that have been in place from the federal government and what's, what we've been able to do with hemp prior to the research program coming on board. So certainly we were looking at a situation where uh, we were starting uh, with research at the same time that producers were moving into a production uh, situation. So um, there are challenges that are ongoing there. The changes in the research program, I think have been favorable, uh, but we certainly need to continue to, uh, to move forward in finding optimal ways of, of production of hemp for CBD. Uh, where the oilseed piece of it comes in. I would also emphasize that there are other opportunities with hemp research beyond, uh, beyond the CBD production and how we look at fiber and seed production uh, in the future is probably an underdeveloped opportunity that we might want to be considering uh, as we move down the road here a little farther. Um, double cropping. Uh, certainly is a, an area that, that uh, deserves some additional attention. Uh, it is a, a way of putting that land into better production, especially when we're looking at, at years that have had low prices for, for wheat in particular. But uh, this year, hopefully, we, we are going to continue to not have that problem and we're going to have good wheat, uh, good wheat prices. But, uh, but the opportunity to, to plug particularly soybeans into that, uh, that later double cropping system is a, is a great option for us. 
Um, weed control options, I look at that as, as really kind of a, a, a two-sided coin. Uh, there's the control issue, but there's also how we're looking at the technology. Uh, and certainly um, the herbicide resistant resistance technology that's been incorporated into uh, the, the seed uh, that, that is produced on about 98% of the acres in, in Kansas um, creates new challenges for us. So while we're always looking for uh, what the management systems look like in those, those herbicide tolerant systems, we're also now faced with the emergence of, of resistant weeds. Uh, I think we have the, uh, have the populations out there right now that have resistance to as many as six different uh, uh, modes of action of, of herbicides. So how we, how we approach weed management in certain parts of the state is really challenged by that. Um, biodiesel, I think there's been a great collaboration between K-State and KU with really KU carrying the, the, the major load there. Uh, there's progress, but I think the biggest issue that we're dealing with with biodiesel is the availability of, of oil, uh, potentially high oil um, uh, varieties. I had a very interesting conversation yesterday with the Soybean Commission about um, where the research priorities maybe need to be going here in the future. Biodiesel is certainly an important, an important consideration. And then the last point in those lists, in that list of six was, uh, was research reporting. And I think there's been um, some, ver some real positives in, in how research uh, reporting has been done, uh, but I think there's also opportunities for, for improvement, whether it be through publication uh, that, that's focused. And we have actually made some changes here at K-State to add some additional sector uh, specific reporting uh, in, in some of the experiment station reports that are coming out. Uh, but, but also there's information that gets communicated on a regular basis through, through county meetings. And so um, I think that uh, as we look at this list, it's a really good place to, to start. I think we need to ask ourselves to the, have, those, uh, have those issues changed? Have they evolved? How has technology played into that? And how has the infrastructure and the capacity of, of our research enterprise across the state uh, created a limiting factor to our ability to meet the needs um, for research on oil seeds and other sectors uh, within the state. So I think I'm pretty close to my five minutes. I should probably go ahead and pass the microphone on to our next, uh, our next group. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Vapor. Those are great uh, comments and points, and it will really uh, stimulate an exciting discussion in your breakout. Um, so let's go ahead and move to uh, Dr. Ellis, who will be giving his uh, thoughts on education and outreach needs. Well, good morning, and thanks, uh, Dr. Thurston, for that opportunity. Um, and again, thanks to the Department of Ag for coordinating this uh, soybean and oil seed session. Um, I want to look through a couple of things uh, from my perspective and looking at across the entire agricultural and, and specifically here the soybean and oilseed production value chain. Um, so when we look at it all the way from uh, production on the farm um, and even backing up a step from the inputs perspective, um, all the way through the value added aspect of processing through into the, uh, the end user side of, uh, of this industry on a consumer aspect. Now, one of the things that um, in that high priority outcome slide that, that Dr. Thurston had up at the beginning was looking at effective education and outreach related to uh, genetic engineering and genetic modification. And I think one of the things that we need to look at um, is Dr. Draper was just talking about from a research perspective is actually engaging in a behavioral based uh, science research with respect to all of the aspects and all the players across this value chain. So whether it be uh, from a production standpoint or a consumption standpoint, that looking at the adoption of these technologies, the acceptance of the technologies and the, the, the value added that's coming through from a production perspective. Because what we're, we're looking at, I, I think is there's a variety of things. One is what is the role of, of soybeans and other um, oil seeds in the production process? Um, and looking at, you know, Dr. Draper talked about from a uh, 
from a double cropping perspective, where does where does it play into that, or is it becoming a more primary primary crop depending on the aspect of the state? And so when we when we think about communications and education and outreach related to that production piece, um, but also looking at adoption of technologies, new technologies, or even just the adoption of including soybeans and oil seeds into that production practice um, as a rotation, as a double crop, as an alternative to existing crops, et cetera. But one of the things we, uh, we need to be looking at too is the, as we're in a production environment facing the changing systems, um, it, there's some, some new research guide, not guidelines, but expectations that are coming out, um, it sounds like from uh, some, some federal conversations I heard about yesterday that looking at, you know, by 2040 increasing or 2050 increasing our production by 40 to 50 percent, but at the same time uh, doing that from a, a reduction of inputs by 40 to 50 percent as well. So, and those inputs are across the board of, of water, nitrogen, uh, crop protection, et cetera. So, so how do we do that from that production perspective? But then also moving this, uh, this research, this education, this outreach piece all the way through. And when we start looking at the value chain in the middle of value added, uh, looking at those other consumers of the products and byproducts of the soybean and oil seed industry, you know, such as uh, livestock industry of, of byproducts from biodiesels as feedstuffs and, and those types of things of seeing how do they adapt, how do they change, how do they integrate those into their processes um, and, and their operations and, and work that they're doing. And then lastly, looking at the consumer side of things in terms of when we think about, for example, the idea of genetic engineering, genetic modification, uh, you know, herbicide resistance, uh, potential disease resistance traits included in the, in the gene base of, of oil seeds as a whole. Um, what's the value and what's the benefit to the consumer for accepting those technologies? So, you know, thinking GMO free kind of statements uh, from their perspective, what what is it that's the value for them of having those in there? Um, they're not necessarily uh, interested in the industry saving money or the producer having uh, improved um, returns when there's no, no differential value to them on the consumer side of that downstream side. So thinking about what's that second level and third level benefit um, that comes from those. So are we looking at GM technologies that increase uh, nutritional value, increase digestive values, reduce allergen levels, you know, all of those types of things that, that that can actually benefit the downstream consumer directly. So I don't think we got a lot of opportunities from a research uh, standpoint of better understanding on the consumer side, risk acceptance, risk, risk tolerance. Um, it's not just a, an educational deficiency or an informational de deficiency environment. Um, there's a, a value acceptance uh, piece that we need to better understand and implement into our communications and educational systems. So uh, with that, I'll uh, turn over the mic to next on, next speaker. Thank you very much, um, uh, Jason. Uh, and uh, well, first of all, I, um, I want to thank KDA for the invitation. Uh, I'm Carlos Campavadal from the IGP Institute here at Kansas State University. Uh, when we talk about the expanded markets, of course, uh, for us, that means uh, growing the export market of Kansas and U.S. Uh, soybeans. Since it's, uh, once the national level grows, of course, the Kansas uh, consu um, exports of soybeans also grow. I, I believe based on, on uh, all the research and information that we have that Kansas in some way has a, a very good advantage and, and still relevant in terms of how the quality of our soybeans uh, always have a relatively higher protein content. And therefore that means that we have a higher amino acid profile of them, which is very, has a very good value when we talk about export markets compared to soybeans from other origins, because uh, when we promote it that way, that means that if it's well balanced, the formulation, uh, companies, animal nutritionists can find a better value of buying or purchasing because they grow their animals faster and more and more efficiently. Um, that's something that at the expert council level with the U.S. Soybean Expert Council, something that has been growing, and we definitely need to target more into that. And another very good opportunity and, and that we have been doing, and I think is still relevant and an advantage, of course, is the location where we are. Uh, one of the biggest clients of uh, in the international scene for U.S. soybeans, of course, is Mexico and Kansas has a direct connection by rail. 
uh, to it. So definitely increasing and continuing uh, nurturing that market with, with Mexico is very important. Mexico gets soybeans also by vessel in other parts of their country. So maintaining that direct line in Kansas and connection between the companies down there is, all, is very important. Uh, with other top partners that we have down there, uh, uh, especially in the Asian continent that's very driven by the containerized facility that we have uh, in Argentine, Kansas by the DeLong. And uh, that kind of goes up and down, of course, based on the demand and the lower demand that has happened because the African uh, swine fever as of lately, trade wars, uh, trade disputes in the past, but that's pretty much taken care. So uh, I think that's something that definitely we need to continue to, to grow. Uh, when I analyze and, and talk a little bit, think about the different outcomes and high priorities that we have been uh, discussing for the last uh, the last year and, and so on, um, I think a little bit on the ranking of them. And of course, I think that just promoting the value of, of Kansas uh, produced oil seeds, focusing of course, mainly on soybean being the number one, uh, definitely we need to figure out, uh, and we're working on an, on a value model where people just don't buy the least cost of soybeans. They just see the value of the quality and interpret it that that will get you in the long run, a better, uh, production of, or your, of, of your animals and livestock. Uh, definitely very important. Uh, right now the, um, oil seed market is driven by, by oil consumption, uh, by human consumption, of course, and by the biodiesel sector. So that's something that definitely we need to continue to grow and think about a little bit, uh, how can we produce more biodiesel? How can we incorporate the other oil seeds uh, like sunflower and canola that we have in the state? Uh, thinking about the, the, the benefits of oil seeds as a feedstuff, of course, uh, all the work that has been done on the research side of, of with soybeans, that's, that's always something that has to continue to be disseminated to our international buyers. And of course, think about a little bit, how can we continue to grow that for the oil, oil seeds? Uh, canola has been always a feedstuff that is very well established as a, as a feedstuff for dairy. Uh, more into the domestic consumption, instead of thinking about the international expanded market, but something to also uh, consider. But one of the growing sectors uh, internationally is the aquaculture. There has been a lot of effort to, to continue to grow that at the national level. So I think that, that Kansas should also continue to, to do that. And, and the Kansas Open Commission has funded several projects on that, but is the fastest growing uh, market with low consumption, but the key is to try to substitute soybean meal as the high protein source for that feed instead of just using that much fish meal that always has a higher price on, on that level. Um, Thinking a little bit about the other high priority uh, outcomes that, that should be continue to grow uh, is very think about the new market that is trying to grow for since 2017 on the high lake soybeans high lake oil it has it's a little bit uh, characteristics that are, is, are healthier than just the regular soybean oil. So that's something that could be actually sourced um, by containers to Southeast Asia where there's always a very high demand of it and uh, continue to put efforts to, to grow that in the acreage and the research in terms of how to store it, in terms of how the, the benefits of the consumption uh, to match the goal that the US Soybean Board wants to put by 2023 on the planted acres of it. Um, um, and last but not, not least, following a little bit of, of what uh, Jason Ellis uh, talked about, outreach and education, uh, is very important to continue to support our export councils and, uh, and, and the different organizations that promote the benefits of, of, of soybeans and soybean meal and other different soy products overall as a, as a main source of protein and amino acid profiles for uh, animal feed. Of course, that's something that is very important and continue to do it also in the oil for the human consumption. There's always the value if that's something that we need to maybe try to move forward with the other oil seeds, uh, canola and some flour and hemp. Uh, here going in Kansas, that also that type of dissemination of information doing by the different uh, outlets that we have is very important to continue to grow and uh, put it in a, in a way that complements what it has been mentioned as Kansas being ag friendly communities. I think that it's also very important to continue in a, in a positive way to promote it besides that, that uh, Kansas farming is sustainable meaning that we don't, we don't overspend our resources, that we align well with best practices on the field. So we could continue to promote that without causing any negative effect on our competitors abroad. 
that we're just saying that we're a little bit better than the others, but not undermining the others because that could trick back again to, to us in the future. So that's some of the main high uh, priority outcomes that I think in terms of ranking and priority should continue to follow. And uh, we could talk more a little bit about those and, and other ones on the details in our breakout session. So with that, I'll pass to Jeanette so we could continue with the rest of our panelists. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much. Excellent points by Dr. Ellis and Dr. Kepavabal. I'm gonna get your name right before the end of this. <laughs> you almost got it, no problem. <laughs> oh, great. All right, so so I'd like to pass the mic over to Dr. Or Mr. Little, um, who's gonna talk about needed infrastructure, um, but also uh, federal considerations. Mr. Little. Thank you for that, appreciate that. Uh, and Kansas Soybean Commission is uh, happy to be with the group uh, this morning and appreciate KDA for uh, putting together this forum. So, uh, and I also think that uh, the theme of growth and the growth summit is is probably the best descriptor for the soybean sector um, right now. So not only for the growth that we've seen over the last uh, 20 years, but also the potential growth that we have going forward. So just for some perspective, um, uh, Kansas soybean producers raised 190.4 million bushels uh, of soybeans on 4.75 million acres last year. Uh, and just a decade ago in 2011, that number was 101 million bushels. So getting close to doubling that um, productivity here in just over 10 years is, is pretty amazing. And I think fits really great with that, with that growth theme. So, um, you know, from our perspective, I think these, um, these key points uh, remain extremely relevant. Um, you heard some some great context from Carlos right before me on um, what what's driving some of the markets and where some of these oil seeds are going, um, and and really so that that ties directly into you know the number one point uh, in this section and that's the promotion of the in-state oil seed processing and those value-added facilities. So um, you know again this might not be this might be more true now than ever uh, with current demand you know fats and oils. For example, for the renewable fuels industry right now is is really driving the oil markets, like Carlos said. Um, oil seeds, as all, all of you probably know, you know those have traditionally been driven by their uh, you know the co-product protein versus the oil side. Uh, but with the value of oil flipped to carrying almost half of the value of soybeans right now, um, it's been a, a major market shift. Um, but that just changes the dynamics, and I think puts even more emphasis on the need for um, the, the in-state processing um, for our oil seeds. Um, and also, you know, when you when you mention value-added facilities, to me that absolutely says animal agriculture and producing animal ag is the easiest way to add value. Um, you know, to soybean protein um, expansion in not only poultry and pork, especially. Um, but even dairy and beef production in state does have a tremendous benefit to the soybean industries uh, and really helps drive that um, value back to the farmers uh, once it, uh, you know, once it gets through the processing side um, here in the state. Um, just touch on a, a handful of the other points uh, in, in this segment, um, identifying the support public private partnerships to fund research priorities, um, you know, from our standpoint, um, from the soybean checkoff side. We see the research community doing a really nice job utilizing outside funding, um, especially the work done in, in collaboration with the checkoff programs on the soy and other side. Um, but um, you know, just having conversations with the with folks from the university here over the last couple of days at various events, um, you know, leveraging those private dollars will be will be ex extremely important um, moving forward as well. So uh, I expect that to to remain key. Um, and really, when it when it comes down to you know at the end of the day that um, the processing facilities having those um, in locations as close to where the production is happening um, as possible will continue to be vital. Um, revitalizing the efforts to develop soy crush in western Kansas, um, especially as we see the soybean acres in the state continue to grow and continue to spread west. Um, more processing uh, in that part of the state will be will be really important, um, but understanding that this will require private, uh, public private investment um, to, to make that happen. Um, and not only for the soybean side, obviously, but uh, for the canola and the industrial hemp 
industries and really oil, any oil seed industry in our state to survive long term, um, it, it will be critical to have processing infrastructure um, in a location that is accessible to farmers and then is also has access to to those markets. So, um, you know, really, at the end of the day, it comes down to infrastructure from the field to the consumer uh, to continue to be able to keep up um, with that demand that we're seeing uh, in, in this space. Great. Thanks so much, Mr. Little, uh, for those great points and look forward to that breakout session. So finally, we have uh, Ms. Nicole Harrison, um, who's going to talk about producer needs. Nicole. Good morning. Uh, thank you for that introduction and thank you for having me. Like she said, I'm Nicole. I am from the Onega area in Northeast Kansas. I farm with my dad and brother on our family farm where we raise soybeans, corn, wheat, hay, and hogs. My role involves overseeing many of the agronomic decisions, all of our precision ag applications, and also the hog operation. Technology plays a major role in all of these areas, whether it be seed trades or fertilizer prescriptions and applications. Data connectivity plays a role in all these areas as well. Like many rural areas, we really struggle with reliable access to a wireless or data connection. We are fortunate to have wireless internet access at our farm, thank you to our local telecommunications company, but the line literally ends just three miles off the road from us. After that, there are very limited options that all have a limited amount of data available to use. And I know so many areas run into the same problem. We are also in a low service area according to multiple carriers, and sometimes the basic function of making a call is limited, let alone sending a file to or from a monitor in the equipment or troubleshooting the planter remotely, which are practices that are becoming more mainstream all the time. However, if you look at a map, it shows that there's coverage, probably even 4G coverage in our area. If you're lucky, if you're lucky you might get that at the top of the hill, but that's about it definitely not in the majority of our area. So this makes it increasingly difficult as well to find a reliable cell phone company when their maps don't accurately represent their coverage in the rural areas. Um, the other form of technology that has a huge impact on us is soybean traits. The last couple years of soybean planting have been interesting to say the least with all of the dicamba label changes and new technologies becoming available. Last growing season, um, distribution of the dicamba products was temporarily paused due to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit vacating the EPA's 2018 conditional registration. So we weren't sure we were actually going to be able to spray dicamba on our soybeans we already had in the ground and growing. Um, then last fall, as we were purchasing our soybeans for the current growing season, we were unsure if a new label would be approved for over-the-top dicamba and exactly what traits we would be able to fully utilize this year, which made it really difficult to decide which beans we were gonna plant. The type of chemistry we can apply is a huge factor for us in deciding which brand and soybeans we will plant. Um, the ordeal from 2020 also shows us that just because we think we have a label for the next year or five, doesn't mean that it's guaranteed or that supplies won't be disrupted. It has also shown us that talking to your neighbors is very important and knowing what they've planted can be beneficial on multiple levels when making decisions and applications. Unbiased research from universities is also very useful in aiding with agronomic decisions. Between field days and publications, we use university research, especially K-State research year round. It is a vital tool that should definitely continue to, to be funded and available. In addition, we as producers really need to continue to follow the recommendations of universities, ag retailers, and chemical companies. We also need to be responsible with our applications and not just so we don't make our neighbors mad. We need to use the recommended rates, multiple modes of action, and overlapping residuals like they have recommended to reduce the opportunity for dicamba and 2,4-D resistant weeds to develop and take over like glyphosate resistant weeds have. 
really it's up to everyone in the ag industry to be responsible stewards and stay updated on changes at the local, state, and federal levels. No matter if it's transportation changes to processing facilities, it is really important for everyone to stay informed. Um, that's what I have. So with that, I'll send that back to Jeanette, Dr. Thurston. Uh, thank you so much. That, those were some really, really great points. I really appreciate it. And so I think we're going to open up now to questions and answers from our expert panel. Uh, Dr. Thurston, we have had a couple questions come in with it. And the first one will be to uh, Jason Ellis, Dr. Ellis. The question is, as you work with future um, educators, future Ag journalists, those uh, disseminating information, how or what's the process behind your processes on making sure that students know good information from possibly misinformation? So what are the messages that you're sending to your students now to help in the future? Yeah, that's a good question. Um... You know, thanks for the 24 hour news cycle and the internet and the concept of backpack journalists and social media, et cetera. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of noise in the communication environments and in the education environment potentially as well. Um, so when we work with our ag communication students specifically, uh, you know, we talk about the idea of validating sources, um, try, just as we do in science, we triangulate the data that we have. So looking at multiple sources, um, and we bring in a little bit of our concepts kind of from a, from a crisis and risk communication perspective in that um, when people see information first, uh, that's the stuff that they hang on to and uh, kind of use as the benchmark to determine the validity of other information. And so uh, looking at communication processes and techniques being uh, first um, or early to get information out there, especially in times of crisis or upheaval situations, uh, it's really important with that. But you know, it, it's really um, getting them to stop and uh, not follow the, for the lack of a better phrase, the clickbait of just perpetuating information that's seen on the internet and passing it along as gospel when read. Um, but, but taking a second thought of, you know, the old adage that if it's too good to be true, then more than likely it probably is. So just reevaluating those sources before you, before you spread that information out there, um, fact checking, double checking, um, you know, those types of things with our communication students, um, you know, and, and with an education perspective, and, and as Nicole mentioned, you know, utilizing those uh, more uh, science-based or the, the identified as non-biased resources, especially in an educational environment, uh, you know, research and extension, land-grant institutions, uh, those, those entities that have a reputation of, of being sound science producing entities, not just universities, but you know, government agencies, a lot of uh, nonprofits and foundations also are, are, are viewed as very, very high quality, uh, unbiased research, looking, looking at the science aspect. And um, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of difference of opinion out there in terms of where the, the level of science literacy um, and, and science understanding, especially in the consumer audience uh, stands. Um, and so, uh, backing it up and, and rethinking about how do we how do we position the information that we're putting out there from a from a science understanding and and it's not all about uh, as I mentioned earlier information and educational deficiency standpoint people may have a really good understanding of the science and technologies etc but they still choose to not want to have it in their food supply and so what is what is the reason behind that what are those um, those intrinsic or emotional um, barriers to acceptance, especially when we get to the consumer side. A lot of the production side is maybe more of an economic or a feasibility standpoint from a, a barrier of adoption, but on the consumer side, it, it's a lot of emotion that, that goes into the, into the decision-making process, not just information. Great, thank you, Dr. Ellis. Um, uh, Dr. Draper, you'd like to jump in on this answer, so go ahead. Yeah, I think I think that, that that Jason makes some excellent points, but uh, you know, one of the challenges that we have is is how we communicate the information so that we make sure that our our audiences understand it. And I think that's a huge challenge with some of our research data 
particularly when some of what we are finding may not agree with industry data or with data that's pr produced out there by, by others. And I think the, the point of the first with the information is, is a really excellent point because often um, our research is making sure that we have the right information and somebody's gonna throw something out there before we get it there. So it really calls for critical thinking by the people that consume that information. Uh, and, and we really hope that, uh, that that's gonna be the, uh, the, the side that wins, that people will look at it more carefully and make sure that they're, uh, they're, uh, they're considering all of the information available to them before they really set their minds on things. But accepted that that's not always the way it works out. So that's a challenge we have to face. Great, thank you. Uh, with that, to stay on time with our agenda, Dr. Thurston, I'll go ahead and turn it back to you. Yeah, thank you. So a good question. I'm sure there's a lot more that can be answered in the individual breakout. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so as, as uh, shared previously, we're gonna go ahead and, and break out into specific breakout sessions. Uh, each one of these sessions will be led by one of our panel um, of experts, and thanks to them for sharing their uh, insights on the outcomes and actions that need to happen in order to achieve our goal of um, uh, really growing the Kansas soybeans and other oilseed sector here in uh, Kansas. Um, so before we get started, though, I, I want you all to, in one question that I really want you to pay attention to when you get into your breakouts, um, when thinking about those previously identified um, outcomes and actions, the things that the points that were made by our panelists, um, I really want you to think about and do something a little bit different and think about what will it take to actually uh, implement those actions. Um, so, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, our outcomes, our priorities, our actions, we write them down, we put them in documents, but then really the next step to really realizing those outcomes and really achieving our goal is putting those actions into action. So what kind of collaborations, what kind of coordination, who needs to be in on making those things um, occur? So let's go ahead and move to the next slide. So in your breakout sections, uh, we really have several goals. We want you to actively address each high priority outcome or maybe the top ones, because some of you have a lot of them. And in 15 minutes, you will not be able to uh, actively address every single one, but identify those most important ones for your group. And also, this doesn't mean that those are the only ones you need to stick to, as stated earlier. There may, may be additional opportunities and challenges that have not been addressed yet. So please bring those up in your sessions. Um, please identify who, so this gets to my last point, needs to work together, what organizations, what individuals, what scientists, what associations need to work together, um, and what resources are needed for success towards achieving that outcome. That's critical for us really making the next step uh, down this path of, um, our goal, our, of achieving our goal. Um, and what specific actions, so when, once you identify what are those actions that the identified partners, each partner really needs um, to participate and to really move this forward. Um, so in each one of these breakouts, we're going to have someone, um, as Dana shared earlier, who will be taking notes. Um, so, but what we're asking each breakout is to have a volunteer of that breakout and uh, preferably not our uh, expert panel member. Um, they'll be responsible for actually doing a report out to the larger group at the end of this uh, breakout session. Um, so please identify that. Um, folks will be taking notes. We'll be sending those notes um, to Dr. Featherstone, who will be kind of giving a summary and uh, economic excuse me, economic outlook at the end of our session today. So are there any questions about the breakout? There's really nothing you need to do. You're just gonna be shuttled uh, virtually into a breakout room, but any specific questions before we move you to your breakout rooms? Dr. Thurston, I'd like to uh, jump in real quick. For those of you that registered um, this morning or close to start time, uh, we knew a lot of you and we placed you in breakout rooms. But if when you get in your breakout room, it's not where you want to be, send me a note in the chat and we'll get you moved over just as soon as possible. Again, we tried to do our best with everything um, this morning. And if you want to change, just drop me a note. Okay, so let's move to the next slide just as um, 
to revisit what are our breakout sessions. So we're going to have a breakout session on research and development. We're going to have a breakout session on education outreach, one on the Kansas oilseed market. And finally, one that's going to combine producer needs, infrastructure, and federal government considerations. So with no questions, then let's go ahead and move us to the breakouts. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Do we have everyone back in the room? It looks like we do. I'm just scrolling through uh, our participants. So I hope you had a really uh, fantastic facilitated breakout session. I hope there were a lot of good ideas, uh, discussion around um, the high priority outcomes that we wanna achieve in the near term and, and long term, um, who needs to work together and what specific actions um, of those individuals, those identified partners uh, needs to occur in order for us to move forward on our goals. So let's go ahead and uh, go to slide 15. We'll just put that up as a reminder of our breakout sessions, and then we can go ahead and um, have our reporters uh, slide 15 breakout session and report out. Okay, so let's go ahead and start with uh, breakout session one research and development. Um, so go ahead and unmute yourself if you were identified as the reporter and let us know uh, how the discussion went and what uh, what are the main priorities that your uh, group identified. Okay, so can you hear me okay? Jeanette, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Megan. <clears throat> yeah, so hello everyone, good morning. My name's Megan Kennelly. I'm the department head for plant pathology at K-State. Uh, so we talked through um, a couple of different priority areas and the short story is a lot of them are priorities for the continued um, research and development in general, we call that an A. Marty asked people to say, is it an A priority or a B priority for all these different things? And um, we, there was a lot of discussion about uh, the like lack of processing facilities and, and some marketing issues with these crops. So we, we said the marketing team, we're, we're kind of giving you some homework here of how we have to um, find some synergies between the research part and then the ultimate processing and marketing goals. So there, there's just a shortage of that for these, for these crops, but it's a definitely an A priority. Um, the second thing was increasing growers and processors engaged in research related to industrial hemp. And we gave this uh, an A priority as well, but we also kind of talked about the marketing side and having that right balance of um, production and processing and having that marketing piece in there so that there is somewhere for the for the crop to grow to go right um, as a as a B area there was um, and this discussion was briefer was about just double cropping systems um, so we just kind of had less discussion there the hot topic with an a plus 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 was weed control. Um, and there was discussion about how there's so much conversation about this. It's a huge challenge. Um, people are trying all kinds of different things. Uh, we touched on soil health as related to weed control um, and then just all the dicamba issues. So this is, is, is a hot topic and it's just growing in importance as a priority. Um, biodiesel. Uh, we gave that a B for research, but an A, marketing people, an A <laughs> priority for the marketing and the mm, like regulation side of, of biodiesel and like carbon related legislation. Our sixth thing was the just getting research, research reports out to people. Uh, and Marty asked about whether people would like it online or in print or both. And the consensus was probably both um, and just getting out, getting it out one way or another um, with recognition that there's bandwidth issues. Uh, but uh, one way people are, are getting access to it is scrolling through Twitter or similar, you know, on phones while waiting in line at places. So having that online access is important. Uh, and then we kind of brainstormed a few new areas, and this is where soil health came back up 
of just you know integrating it from the soil all the way up the chain vertically to the final product. And a, a piece of that was just making sure that people um, are well equipped to to like hand off a fully healthy system to the next generation that takes over um, our, a farm. Um, and then we also talked just a little bit about carbon sequestration again, and then we ran out of time. So I hope that captures it. Yeah, that's excellent. Thank you, Megan. It sounds like your group had a, a really lively discussion. Um, so let's go ahead and move on to education outreach to keep us on schedule. Um, it was uh, Dr. Ellis's team. So if that reporter can go ahead and unmute and give us your report out. Hey everyone, it's Jancy. I'm with Kansas Soybean. And I think for us, um, we kind of dove into the weeds on a very specific topic, but I think overall looking at who can connect um, in the room, we had rep representatives from K-State Conservation, um, the Kansas Foundation for Ag in the Classroom and then Soybeans. But I think just, a general note of I think we can always do a better job of connecting and communicating to be able to ensure that we're touching the masses as far as education and outreach efforts go and that we're doing a good job of connecting with folks, um, doing a good job of collaborating so we're not um, repeating what we're doing, we're hitting different demographics with our conversations and with our efforts and that we're doing things while we may be doing different things and have different um, kind of to targets and focus areas that we're not duplicating efforts and we're able to do a good job of reaching folks was still kind of a collective message as a whole. Um, we really, as far as the priorities, we kind of um, got stuck and dove into one more in depth, which was talking about general acceptance of agriculture um, very specifically. And I think this update was made, um, if I'm not mistaken, but um, it used to always be the focus was on GMOs. So talking about what are the current consumer issues um, Brianna, Brianna no, noted with KFAC, um, talking to teachers about GMOs five years ago was really hard, but now it's it's a much more easier thing to talk about. And so the conversation in the consumer space that we work in has moved towards sustainability and a lot of chemical conversations and folks being wary of chemicals. And I think we see that in a lot of different ways. Um, it touches from cleaning products people use to different things, but also I think it touches what the farmers are able to use and how do we ensure that chemicals accepted. So as the first group talked about, weeds are an issue, um, but also just to ensure that farmers have all the tools in their toolbox. Um, so just kind of some general conversation about um, languages that are being used in the efforts that we can do going forward. So thank you. Okay, excellent comments uh, by you and your team there, JC. Thank you so much. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to Kansas oilseed markets and reporter, please unmute. So Carlos, do you have a reporter that can do a report out for us? Uh, yes. Uh, so okay. So um, I think we had a we had a reporter there, but not not an issue. Uh, so part of the things that uh, that we were uh, talking a little bit um, on the was pretty much focused on the advantages that that Kansas soybean what what the high priorities of continue to promote uh, Kansas with uh, and over US soybeans with a higher protein and make that difference on, on that level worldwide. But uh, one of the issues that that uh, that were brought up and, and discussed a little bit in our breakout session was that uh, the, the, the seed companies are currently actually promoted lower protein to increase yield. And of course, that, that actually brings down a little bit part of that differentiation that the different expert councils uh, on the soybean side are, are using to differentiate ourselves from uh, soybeans from other origins like South America or other places around the world. So some of the concerns, of course, will be is that um, increasing that yield, will that overcome that uh, value of differentiation. I mean, we're, we're not going to lose market share, but we will lose value in terms of, 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 of depending on the time of the year when that when soybeans are sold worldwide. But that's something to always to consider and put a little bit more um, more into, into content, of course. And, and then, of course, uh, part of the thing uh, that we were uh, talking a little bit about the, the difference uh, uh, of the oil seeds of Kansas to, as part of a feed stuff is that um, the concern, of course, is that the lack of processing facilities and how can we overcome that? I know it's not directly uh, part of that 
of our breakout session, but it, it has a direct impact, of course. If, if we're growing canola and some flowers in Western Kansas and the plant shuts down, how do we move that and how that could be addressed that? But of course, it all comes up uh, with the lines of transportation of getting the the product to to where it needs to go in terms of the consumer. So that's something that 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 we're discussing. And, and at the end of the day, um, it's very difficult to come up with a solution. But if the production facilities are not there and they're still to grow, those old seeds won't. And livestock is nearby. This other alternative for more like uh, uh, small processing scales for local consumption of those feed stuff too, not putting outside international market, but just put it back into that same domestic market and start to bring in something, for example, a soybean meal from a different location uh, from the crushers itself. So that's something that a little bit while we had time to, to discuss and, and uh, uh, we're not able to actually continue more beyond that due to the time limitation, but I think there was a very good discussions. Thank okay, ex okay, excellent. Thank you, Carlos and your team. And so finally, uh, Caleb and Nicole's team that uh, discussed producer needs infrastructure and federal government considerations. Yeah, uh, hi, Jeanette. This is Randy Stuckey with uh, Renew Kansas Biofuels Association. I'm gonna report out on, on our discussion this morning. We had some, some producers in the group and it worked out really well to hear their feedback and um, a lot of discussion about uh, beneficial new technologies and practices for producers that uh, certainly help or can help with uh, fighting weed resistance and encouraging sustainable ag practices that um, will be the future of production agriculture. We talked a little bit about the barriers to implementation of those technologies and practices. There's obviously um, some cost barriers. Uh, we talked about the uh, the dollar per acre. acre um, you know, cost, uh, is there, you know, should the producer invest in that technology? And, um, and certainly the higher green prices we're seeing right now uh, help to incentivize a greater adoption of those technologies and uh, for sustainable agriculture technologies and precision ag, when you're talking about variable rates of uh, application for fertilizer and pesticides. Um, so, th so that's good to see, um, obviously. Uh, but also we talked about some, some government, uh, federal government considerations and, and barriers to implementation of some of those new technologies. Uh, we went down the, the trail of, of talking about uh, the dicamba tolerant beans, soybeans, and um, the implementation over the last few years of that technology. Um, there's been hiccups both with the um, neighbor to neighbor uh, application of, of the, that new technology, um, not just in Kansas, but across uh, the Midwest. And then also some of the label considerations uh, with EPA, both through the EPA's um, approval and reapproval of, of the label and the new label restrictions on those uh, for those products, but also the, the uh, lit litigation that's occurred against um, use of the new technologies for dicamba. Um, and in Colorado last year that uh, really shut down um, application of or use of, of dicamba, the new dicamba um, pesticides last year and also could, could um, be a potential hurdle moving forward, depending on what happens with some of the, uh, the lawsuits moving forward. So we talked about uh, that being a hurdle and how to address that hurdle would be continued uh, both through the, the associations, your Farm Bureau, Soybean Association, uh, folks like uh, what, we, what we do here in our office, uh, reaching out to the, the federal policymakers at EPA and, and then also at the, at the state level. And, and so not just uh, through, through the associations, but the importance of individual producer, producers having those relationships with their individual regulators and, um, and, and legislators locally so that when those issues come up, they can help from a producer from aspect help inform and educate those legislators that more and more or have a, a more of further distance from any connection to production agriculture. And, and that's just gonna grow in the out years as, as people move further off the farm. And we have uh, uh, fewer representation even in, in the ag producing areas of the state. So the importance of producers taking the time to, to reach out to their leg local legislator and help inform and educate those folks that that are going to be making the decisions um, for them on 
on the use of these technologies moving forward. So that's a little bit about what we talked about in uh, our breakout. Yeah, great overview. Thank you, Randy. Um, so that concludes our breakout session. But you know, I just want to thank everybody um, for participating. And this is not the end of the discussion. I hope you'll continue to be engaged so we can talk a little bit deeper about how to actually uh, realize these outcomes that you've identified in these sessions. So we're going to go just a little bit over. So I hope you can all hang with us a little bit more. Our next speaker, let's go ahead and go to the next slide is Dr. Alan Featherstone, who's department head of Ag Econ here at K-State. And he's going, he's been listening to the report outs, he's gotten notes from the report outs, and he's gonna talk a little bit about those in consideration of the economic outlook for the sector. Dr. Featherstone. Hopefully uh, people can hear my slides and, and hear me. Um, I thought in terms of uh, kind of setting this, uh, economic outlook in context. Um, the first thing I did is just look at oilseed acreage harvested in Kansas. And uh, um, in the uh, left-hand slide, you have uh, soybeans. The uh, right-hand slide, you have sunflowers and canola. I think one of the important things is that we continue to see um, increases in um, soybean um, acres harvested. Um, in, in terms of it's uh, drastically increased in terms of 1924, I think we started with something like 400 or 500 acres in, uh, in soybeans. Um, if you compare that to the right, essentially you have sunflowers and canola, and uh, um, essentially you can see that the scale is, is quite a bit less. And in some respects, both um, sunflowers and canola have fallen off. I would argue that uh, this was probably due to the loss of processing facilities. And a number of the groups had talked about processing facilities, the need to be important in terms of uh, essentially sunflowers and canola. Um, I think that they will be stunted until there is a ready market. In terms of people were excited, I know of some producers that were excited with regards to canola. Um, there was a facility and now in order to sell their uh, canola, they have to transport it up to uh, South Dakota um, in order to, to get it processed. Sunflower, same type of thing in terms of they lost the sunflower plant in uh, um, Northwest Kansas. And so all of a sudden, if there's not a ready market and there's alternative uh, high um, priced alternatives, um, farmers will produce for that market. And so the processing facilities are really important on oil seeds. In terms of uh, industrial hemp, again, to give you the scale of that, in terms of uh, 400, uh, 4,000 acres planted in uh, 2020, according to uh, KDA, 700 acres harvested. Same type of thing with regards to there. Um, this isn't a story in Kansas that I'm aware of, but there is a um, story of a uh, producer in Illinois that I'm aware of that produced uh, industrial hemp, um, thought they had a market. Um, the market wasn't there. The industrial hemp is sitting in a shed waiting for some opportunity um, to be processed. And so um, the um, key thing in order to make these things work is um, farmers can produce um, very well, um, but if there isn't a market in a place to uh, um, turn that into uh, um, revenue to pay for inputs in that, um, that is a, a key issue. The other thing going on in Kansas is just a drastic shift with regards to acres. I have the uh, 2021 expected acres, but over the last six years, essentially corn production in terms of acres harvested have went up by 38%. Um, sorghum, we've lost 6% of our acres. Um, soybeans, 18% increase. Wheat, we've lost 21%. And the total of those four crops has, has went up 1%. And so um, some of the other crops uh, essentially are uh, um, becoming less favorable. And again, I think that's due to the uh, um, price situation, especially in 2021 and uh, late 2020 with regards to the traditional crops. If there's an opportunity to make profit with traditional crops um, because of the market, because of the less risk, 
associated with having a commodity that you may or may not be able to market, they're going to essentially move into the traditional um, crops and, and that will push things like canola, hemp, um, sunflowers out of the uh, production ben benefit. Um, in terms of, uh, and, and this also kind of leads up with regards to this, um, in terms of it's very important that you think about um, the production, not only in the consumer, not only in the US, with soybeans, it's much more global. And I think with a lot of the oil seeds, it's much more global. And in some respects, I think we have a tendency in, uh, in Kansas to kind of think of the US consumer, which is very important. Um, but if you look at the soybean um, position, I, I think it's just a little bit uh, um, more important in terms of essentially with uh, three countries, you uh, essentially have the bulk and I'll illustrate this a little bit more. But with three countries, you have the bulk of soybean production in the world in terms of, and if you look at the Americas, the Americas produce 84% of the world's soybean production. And so from an oil seed pers perspective, it's much different than the other commodities. And uh, be because of that, um, um, there's not a lot of places that the world could go. On the uh, right-hand side graph basically is looking at importing countries. Um, one of the things you can see is roughly at, before 2000, China was irrelevant. Um, and if you look at kind of where the market is and kind of what was going on from an import position, um, it would have been just a nice trend, kind of a slow growth trend. Um, but basically what happened is China came into the market and uh, China has uh, um, dominated the uh, market with regards to uh, um, the, uh, the red line at the top there. In terms of, uh, again, this just illustrates the percentage of uh, global production um, of soybeans. And again, you can see just the three countries, the US, Brazil, Argentina, and the rest of the world. Um, one of the things you see is that the U.S. is actually losing market share, and this is through uh, 2019. And you got to remember 2019 is a little bit of an anomaly simply because uh, production was down there. The other thing, and, and this is where I'm really important that we do think about our consumers in terms of the U.S. of the crop, more than 50% was exported in uh, 2019. And so if we're going to have a domestic view, um, we're going to really need to uh, um, realize that we're only talking about half of our crop. Um, in terms of Brazil, Brazil exports about 63, 64% of the crop. Argentina, and this is raw soybeans, if I would put meal and oil there, um, you'd see a little bit different, but because of the tax policy in Argentina, there's an incentive for them to process into oil and meal before it's exported as opposed to um, the raw bean. But uh, again, I think thinking of the consumer is pretty important. Um, in terms of uh, the graph on the left here basically shows the US, Brazil and Argentina exports and what China ends up taking up. Um, one of the things from a geopolitical perspective, um, certainly losing China mark the mark Chinese market was very important for the US producer. However, but if, if you really think about it, um, in terms of China was in more of a difficult position than, than the US producer was because there was no way that China could meet its soybean needs um, from Brazil, Argentina, and the rest of the world. And, and so from that perspective, um, I, I think it is important that sometimes we think that uh, um, the US is in a difficult position with China, but if you flip it around, China's probably in a more difficult position than the US. The other thing, and this is really going to affect the outlook of oil seeds, specifically soybeans going in the future, is essentially the Chinese government um, is basically moving from a, uh, um, a backyard production system to a confined system with a vegetable diet, simply to uh, uh, affect some of the concerns with the African swine flu that uh, Carlos um, um, indicated, simply um, having um, um, 
hogs all over the country in, in open air is not as good from a disease pre 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 prevalence. And, and so from that perspective, um, I think the outlook for Chinese soybean exports is, uh, is pretty high. And, and again, looking at the top soybean importing countries in 2019, and um, this is uh, um, pretty constant over the years, um, China basically imports 60% or every three bushel of five bushel exported goes to China. Mexico is number two, Carlos mentioned that. Um, and then um, Argentina actually imports some beans to, to process those into uh, uh, meal and oil. And then you have Egypt and the Netherlands. And then you, you can look at the, the uh, share of uh, US exports. You can kind of see what the trade war did in uh, 2019 that started back up. But uh, um, Mexico is a very important market, um, Asia, EU, um, rest of the world, Central America is, is looking at this, but uh, where the US ex or uh, the top exporting countries or Brazil has 47% of the market, US has 38. And again, um, the US and Brazil normally are a little bit closer, but again, the 2019 is a bit of an anomaly. Um, the other thing is there's a lot of research going on and Carlos also alluded to this in his uh, uh, breakout group. Um, the nutritive value of soybean meal processed from US soybeans and Brazilian soybeans are not the same. Um, with our Master of Agribusiness program, we actually had a uh, um, individual that works for the uh, Soybean Export Council in China. And she went around to a, a number of mills and uh, evaluated um, based on the source of beans, um, what the nutritive content is. And you can kind of see what she ended up finding um, with regards to soybeans from the US have uh, major amino acids. And, and so soybeans are not soybeans that I think are pretty important. The two more slides here, one is just the profitability. In terms of looking at the futures market, soybeans are going to be very profitable over the next few years. And then in terms of uh, essentially return above variable cost per bushel, um, essentially um, um, in some respects, there was the old adage that hogs were the mortgage lifter. I think the soybean crop in uh, Kansas right now is the mortgage, mortgage lifter. And then the economic concepts that I think are very important that certainly came out of the uh, um, groups um, and uh, in that is um, producing for the consumer. And I think it's important to realize that uh, roughly 50% of our beans are not for the US consumer. And so I think in terms of thinking about supply chain development, in terms of education, um, certainly it's, it's not all the US consumer in terms of um, we'll, we would be in trouble if we had to sell all of our soybeans to the US consumer. Um, processing facilities are really key. Um, I think it's really affecting negatively um, so sunflower and canola and hemp in terms of if those industries are going to take off, I think there needs to be some real thought with regards to making sure that there are markets close to the producer such that those that grow the crop um, can end up getting processed and, and not pay large transportation costs, which you question um, shipping product all over the US for processing in terms of what the sustainability of that is. Um, infrastructure was brought up and, and so certainly that's the key in terms of transportation, broadband, all of those things are gonna be pretty important in terms of technology ad ad adoption into the future. Um, input uh, substitution, I think, is also extremely important. Um, and in, in terms of there was the Dicamba discussion, it's really important, for example, that uh, there are input substitutions and we don't get into a situation um, where there's only one technology simply because of uh, um, um, weed adoption and, and some of those types of things um, that can be problematic. The other thing I would caution about sustainability is to me, it's a journey and not a destination. Sometimes we get the idea that sustainability is a destination, but what we're doing now, I think in 15, 20, 25 years, people are gonna laugh at us with regards to the th thought that we viewed that as sustainable. And just like if we go back 10, 15, 20 years to what we were doing then, in terms of people now, 
would argue that that wasn't sustainable. And so I, I think sometimes we get this idea that we're going to get the holy grail with regards to sustainability and then we're going to be done. Um, to me, it's going to be an evolving process. And I, I think it's really important that we realize that, that we are going to continue to adapt, that producers will continue to adapt. And there's probably a lot more wisdom out there in the uh, um, um, farm producer um, um, realm than sometimes we as educators give them, uh, give them credit for. Um, in terms of, I think they do realize that sustainability is there. They do adapt to um, new technology. But I think there also is the aspect that they've been adapting for 15, 20, 25, 30, 40, 50 years if they've produced that many crops. And, and, and so um, to me, I think it is important to give them the information. Um, but uh, to me, for example, um, the Kansas producer, just as the US producer, is pretty quick to adapt to technology. Um, and that's my last slide. Thanks. Great, Dr. Featherstone. Thank you for sharing your slides with us and your wisdom and knowledge as well about the soybean uh, and oilseed sector from economic point of view. With that, we're going to wrap up. First of all, thank you very much for everybody that stuck with us as we ran over a little bit uh, with it. But what we're going to do is go back and look over all the comments and the notes that were taken. We'll update that sector document with information that is uh, coming from today. So excited about that piece. So I just want to follow up with, you know, thank you for your participation in soybeans and other oilseed session today. The recording of the webinar will be uh, on the same page for you guys registered at. So in the next couple of days, look for that in case you want to share that with some folks in your organization or uh, neighbors, et cetera, with that. So we're hoping that you'll join us for our in-person event on Thursday, August 25th in Manhattan. You, again, uh, can register on the same page where you registered for this webinar. And before we go, I want to highlight the second year that the Kansas Department of Agriculture's Kansas Ag Heroes, uh, and we're accepting nominations right now for any individual family or business in Kansas agriculture that you believe provided a notable contribution to the ag industry or their community in the last year. Nominations for that are currently open and will close on August 13th. With that, thank you to our speakers. Thank you, Dr. Thurston, for moderating uh, those that have participated, and thank you for your input during the panel discussion. With that, have a great morning. <laughs>